Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Environmental Planning Commission meeting of March 22nd, 2023. I call the meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. For those joining us in person, please note that due to our hybrid environment, audio and video presentations can no longer be shared from the lectern. Requests to show an audio or video presentation during a meeting should be directed to EPC at mountainview.gov by 4.30 p.m. on the meeting date. Additionally, due to our hybrid environment, we will no longer have speakers line up to speak on an item. Anyone wishing to address the EPC in person must complete a yellow speaker card. Please indicate the name you would like to be called by when it is your turn to speak and the item number on which you wish to speak. Please complete one yellow speaker card for each item on which, which you wish to speak and turn them into the EPC clerk as soon as possible, but no later than the call for public comment on the item you are speaking on. Instructions for addressing the commission virtually may be found on the posted agenda. Now I will ask the EPC clerk to proceed with roll call. All commissioners are present. Thank you very much. Um, we will move on to oral communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons wishing to address the EPC on any matter not on the agenda. Speakers are allowed to speak on any topic for up to three minutes during this section. State law prohibits the commission from acting on non-agenda items. If anyone in attendance would like to provide comments on non-agenda items, please fill out a yellow speaker card and provide it to the EPC clerk. If anyone on Zoom would like to provide comment on non-agenda items, please click the raise hand button in Zoom or press star nine on your phone. Phone users can mute and unmute themselves with star six. EPC clerk, are there any yellow cards tonight? Um, no one in the audience willing to speak. Okay, thank you so much. Then we will move on to our public hearings. Uh, the first agenda item is 5.1, 189 North Bernardo Avenue office project. We will first have a staff presentation, then an applicant presentation, then questions by the EPC, followed by public comment. At the closure of public comment, the commission will then deliberate and take action. Do any commissioners wish to make disclosures, such as contacts with the applicant or site visits? Please do so now. Okay. Commissioner Cranston? I visited the site. Commissioner Haymeyer? Same. Seeing none others, then we will have pres uh, staff presentation from Brittany Whitehill, project planner, and Diana Pencholi, principal planner, followed by the applicant's presentation. Thank you, please proceed. Thank you, sorry about that, just having a brief screen sharing. I think we're in business. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Brittany Whitehill, and tonight I am joined by principal planner Diana Pancholi. The item for your consideration this evening is an office development located at 189 North Bernardo Avenue. This project is located on an approximately 3.8 acre site on the southeast corner of North Bernardo Avenue and Central Expressway in the East Wisman Precise Plan, Employment Character Area South. The site has a general plan land use designation of high intensity office and surrounding land uses include office and R&D uses to the north and west of the project site, central expressway, multifamily and mobile home uses and the Caltrain tracks are located to the south and east. The site is currently developed with an existing two story office building which will remain with this project and surface level parking. In January of 2018, the City and Los Altos School District, or LASD, established a Transfer of Development Rights TDR program. This project was authorized to receive, or to utilize up to 28,000 square feet of TDR floor area at that meeting. The applicant hosted a community meeting in January of 2022. However, no member of the public attended. In March of 2022, the project was considered by the EPC at a study session. EPC expressed support for the project and directed the applicant and staff to study refinements. 
which focused primarily on landscaping and amenity areas. The project was initially reviewed by the DRC in February of 2022 and subsequently, subsequently received a recommendation of conditional approval in October. Following today's EPC meeting, the project is scheduled to go to City Council in May of 2023, where a final decision will be made. The project proposes to renovate the existing office building, which is shown in blue on the site plan. Construct a new four-story office building, shown in the darker yellow color, and construct a new six-level parking garage with two levels below grade, shown in the paler yellow color. And access to the site will remain off of North Bernardo Avenue. In addition to the 28,000 square feet of TDR floor area from the LASD TDR program, the project requests to utilize approximately 48,000 square feet of bonus FAR as part of the East Wisman Precise Plan Bonus FAR program. The new office design has, or the new office has been designed to appear as a floating glass building with sweeping curvilinear facades and building entries with canopies incorporating warm accent materials. Minor renovations to the existing office building are proposed and these focus on entries to complement the entries of the new office. The new garage incorporates a printed screen facade material for the first two levels with metal fins accenting the top two levels. And the project was reviewed by the DRC and received a recommendation for conditional approval um, with conditions focusing on minor landscaping improvements and refinements to the office and garage design. 111 trees, including 61 heritage trees, are proposed to be removed to construct the project due to their condition and or conflict with the building footprint, underground garage, and multi-use path. The applicant has worked extensively with city staff to develop the optimal site design to achieve tree preservation where possible while providing public access envisioned in the East Wisman Precise Plan Complete Streets Network. The replanting plan features 220 new trees, including 46 coast live oaks and 36 valley oaks at key locations throughout the site. The project will result in a net increase in tree canopy at full maturity, and the proposed plant palette provides varied robust landscaping with 85% native plants. In compliance with the East Wisman Precise Plan, the project proposes a multi-use path with bicycle facilities and a north to south pedestrian paseo. Additionally, the project will provide approximately 23,000 square feet of privately owned, publicly accessible, or POPA open space, which would feature bike fix-it stations, sport and games courts, pedestrian scale lighting, seating, and barbecues. As previously noted, the project requests use of approximately 48,000 square feet of bonus FAR in exchange for a community benefits contribution of approximately $1.3 million. And staff recommends that these funds be allocated to the Bernardo Undercrossing CIP project. Lastly, in exchange for the 28,000 square feet of floor area through the LASD TDR program, the applicant has committed approximately $3.6 million to LASD to support their acquisition of a new school site in the San Antonio Precise Plan area. The project complies substantially with the East Wisman Precise Plan employment character area standards and requests minor exceptions to the required number of loading spaces and to multi-use path and north-south Paseo standards. These exceptions will allow for additional landscaping within the surface parking area and preservation of nine additional heritage trees. The project complies with the general plan, high intensity office uh, land use designation. An initial study of environmental significance was prepared for the project and concluded that with implementation of city standard conditions of approval and certain mitigation measures from the East Wisman Precise Plan EIR, the project would not result in any new or more significant impacts over those previously identified. So in conclusion, staff recommends that the EPC recommend the City Council adopt the initial study and approve the planned community permit, development review permit, and heritage tree removal permit as shown in the staff report. 
and city staff is present and available for questions and the applicant team also has a brief presentation to share. Thanks. Commissioners, my name is Ken Rodriguez, uh, KRP Architects, Mountain View, California. And I'm gonna briefly go through a very short um, slide presentation uh, with the help of um, uh, Gary Lehman from the Gazzardo Partnership, Landscape Architects, and uh, our client, uh, Steve Lynch uh, from Sand Hill Properties. So let's go to the first slide if we could. Um, when we were before you, uh, previously as outlined by staff, um, you had suggested that we take um, really an entirely different look at the surface parking area leading to the garage in that it was an asphalt uh, parking area before. There was a lot of talk uh, from the EPC to enhance that area and make it look um, um, more urban, uh, more unique uh, materials. We, we did just that. We eliminated the asphalt, created a, a beautiful um, series of concrete um, um, design elements and features that not only occur in the parking lot, we added landscaping, as staff mentioned, we also created this strong north-south connection between the existing building and building two per your recommendation. Um, you also asked for an enhanced um, element at the corner of uh, Bernardo and Central Expressway um, because of the, the future undercrossing. Uh, we, we provided a plaza there, some artwork, and then again, uh, a very nice open space um, uh, plaza element in the landscaping all along North Bernardo. Again, a suggestion by the EPC. Um, let's go to the, the first slide of the, the building. Um, uh, keep going, if we could. Next slide. Um, so this is just an overall aerial view that shows um, our project. Um, as staff mentioned, we are remodeling building one. We mentioned to you last time when we were here, there is a longer term lease. It's not a long term lease, but on that building, but we have always thought through with this new design uh, that that building at some point might be replaced and the underground garage connected for that building as well. Next slide. Um, and these are just some quick visual images from that um, enhanced landscape area. We added an outdoor sport court area. Again, uh, additional landscaping. We're in re we are in concurrence with staff's recommendation to eliminate the additional um, loading spaces to create more landscaping. Next slide. And these are just a series of slides from Central Expressway. We think this building is going to be very striking, not only in the daytime, but in particular at nighttime as you traverse um, uh, east-west on, on, um, on the expressway. Next slide. This gives you a shot of that north-south connection. And we've set that up so that the adjacent site, which is in the foreground where the empty parking stalls are, um, uh, can connect to that and then again connect to the multi-use path. Next slide. And here's a shot at night across Central Expressway, the building and the additional parking garage. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a photograph of the multi-use path uh, and connection in that uh, between buildings, between the existing building and the new building. Um, we've, we've really tried to create this very pedestrian, bicycle-oriented connection per staff and the precise plans um, um, requirements. Next. Uh, this is the building entry um, uh, and lobby space. Next shot. Uh, and this, uh, lastly, is another connection for pedestrians between the uh, parking garage and the new building uh, with some outdoor seating and cafe element off the multi-use path. Next. So with that, I will turn it over to Gary Lehman, our landscape architect, and let him go through these slides. Good evening. We're very excited to bring this to you today. Um, as, as Ken mentioned, one of the real um, exciting components to this was the development of the public open spaces uh, throughout the project and the connectivity, the flowing of pedestrians through the spaces to really make this a very inviting uh, environment that uh, 
you know, really creates significant value for the whole community. Uh, you can see in this slide here, you know, we're using a very rich palette of materials, you know, paving, lighting, uh, seating elements to really create a very inviting space and make it feel warm and uh, attractive uh, from, from the outset. Next slide, please. The overall landscape plan uh, shows, as the diagrams did before, how the, the, uh, the public circulation can move through the space. Uh, we're excited about the corner plaza there at the corner of uh, Bernardo and Central, uh, creating a real sort of gateway element there uh, with the existing building as a backdrop. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of green here. Uh, we worked very hard with staff to sort of massage the site to really look for ways to be able to increase the tree canopy uh, throughout the site and to increase landscape area um, as a component, a real beautiful setting for these, um, both the existing and the new buildings to, uh, to rest within. There's some enlargements of those areas. On the right, you see the uh, corner plaza with the existing office building there. And you can see we used sort of a striped paving material to really create sort of a, a sense of energy and movement uh, through the space. We have courtyard walls, seating elements, very nice, elegant lighting, um, and very convenient uh, bicycle facilities uh, located throughout to really encourage alternative um, means of transportation to the site. And this, the slide on uh, the image on the left is the central core space, which um, utilizes some of the nice elements of the existing building and then builds in new planters, um, new outdoor amenities like living walls, uh, recreational areas, as well as seating, um, just to create a very warm, inviting environment. Next slide, please. And then we have this, this additional pathway that connects the um, uh, multi-use trail into the center area of the office building entry as well as to the garage area. And again, really working, planting into a number of these areas which have the parking uh, underneath. In addition to all that, on the roof of the office building, we have this really nice uh, roof garden, uh, which will be able to take advantage of terrific views offsite, um, both the north and south. And you can see this is really set up to be um, a really wonderful place for people to be able to go outside and work, to be able to socialize, um, you know, really take advantage of that elevated status and to enjoy that environment. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Commission. <clears throat> My name is Steve Lynch with Sand Hill Property Company. So um, we don't have a lot to add to the presentation. Our final slide is just showing some of our community benefits to outline your staff report. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions you have. The only thing I would add is just thank you to staff. Um, it's a very thorough report. Um, we support it, and we're, we're here to answer any questions. So. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So now I'll ask if uh, commissioners have any questions. Commissioner Clark. I have one, it's probably for the applicant. I'm just, uh, I think as part of this, we're um, in the plans, we're also approving the renovation for the, for the existing building, building one. I was just curious about how you plan to, to phase things. Are you gonna do that first or in concert with the new building or new building first and then renovate the other one? since you have a tenant there already? Correct, so it is gonna be a little bit tricky on the timing. In fact, the site work is gonna be probably the most most difficult in terms of timing. So we're probably going to do everything at one time, but right now we're waiting to see what happens. So the, build, the existing building is actually, I think there are two tenants in there substantially vacant. Unfortunately, we lost our primary tenant, um, which was uh, SETI, I know sort of a famous use here in Mountain View. Um, so we're sort of waiting to see what happens with the other two, and if we can kind of time it right, we'll have you know a vacant building, or we'll be able to have those tenants expand. So, um, luckily, we're looking at mostly exterior renovations on the building at this point, so it's not too intrusive. Um, but the 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 site work, and it's particularly some of the tree work we're going to have to do, is going to be a little bit trickier in, in terms of working around that tenant's needs. So, thank yeah. you. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Um just see that uh, Vice Chair Dempsey had concluded. Okay. I'm not sure if this Go is ahead. actually working, Vice Chair. Oh, it's chair. possible, yeah. yeah. So 
apologies for that. So my question is pretty simple for the team. So last year when we spoke about the plan, uh, there was concerns about uh, the parking spaces, right, for bicycles. Um, and it, just for the public to know, would you be able to point out to those modifications you made in request to our question of, can you redo these? Where are they? Maybe bring up the uh, slides of the enlargements. Probably the easiest place to see those. One moment. Yeah, while the slide's coming up, there's both bicycle parking provided uh, conveniently to the doors of the, uh, the buildings themselves. Uh, at multiple locations, um, and then also at the community uh, public amenity spaces. So say, for instance, in the upper right-hand corner there at the plaza, there's uh, bicycle racks um, in the uh, kind of on the right side there, closest to Bernardo, just to the up and to the right from that asterisk there. And then there's uh, bicycle lockers located down that lower uh, portion of that area where the exactly where that uh, sort of gray color is. We have the lockers very conveniently located there. And then bicycle racks in the central plaza area, um, uh, kind of amidst that uh, striped paving area. Uh, it's both close to, uh, to both building entries, so very convenient located. There's also to further encourage uh, cycling. And of course, we have the path, the multi-use path, which is a huge amenity. But there, uh, between the existing building and the new building, we also have uh, drinking fountains and water fill stations. Um, so it's really um, making it very convenient for people to be able to utilize those spaces. I think there's one more slide that also shows uh, bicycle parking um, there um, between the garage and the um, and the office building. And then on the far left of this picture, you have the multi-use sport court area, which also has bicycle parking there. So kind of at all the gateway entry points into the site, there's always bicycle parking available to allow people to be able to um, secure their bikes and go and use the amenities there. Great, thank you so much. I had to ask the question just for follow-up. That way the community knows you did uh, your best effort to meet those requests that we had at the EPC for this type of alternative transportation option. And much appreciate your hard work on all this in partnership. Thank you. You're welcome. Vice Chair Dempsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I have a quick question for the applicant and then I have a longer question for staff, but the applicant, if I could just, um, all the way in the corner, you have the sport court. I recall reading from the staff report that it was gonna be a bocce court. Is that correct? There is sort of a flex uh, court space. It's not near the uh, that portion of the site. It's actually uh, closer to Bernardo along uh, the uh, that lower property line area there. So it's right on one of the pedestrian uh, pathways. And uh, so it's sort of a mixed use. You could have a bocce, you can uh, do cornhole, you know, it has a nice bench there and shaded trees and, and such. So it does have that amenity provided. Uh, the reason why I ask is I know that there's different sports have different levels of uh, sort of impact here in the city. I know that sometimes soccer fields are really hard to get a hold of. I know pickleball courts are fighting with tennis courts and who's gonna have what space. Um, if you are gonna have a space that has any kind of amenity that is like that, um, I would just submit to you, you may wanna to talk to like Rex and Park or some city organization that has a sense of which types of courts are most impacted, because it would be great to see you put in a court of the type that people are, um, don't have enough of in Mountain View, because then you, then you really make sure that you're gonna have people really coming in there and utilizing that space heavily, which is what we wanna see happen here. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And what we're looking at providing is kind of a diverse uh, set of amenities. So you have the more active amenities over on the far left where you have sort of a, a mixed uh, sport court type area. And then you have this little bit more passive area that's uh, closer to the existing office building. So sort of a nice uh, diversity. People can choose how they want to use it. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, Madam Chair, with your forbearance, the, the second question I had for staff, and it, it pertains to the jobs housing balance question. It, and my understanding is, is that this project is not affected by the jobs housing requirement that was in the EWIP, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. That's true, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So the, I, am, I ask this question perhaps because I'm a bit sensitized from you know, months and months of doing housing element, that when you add commercial space, it creates in a delayed form a, a housing requirement that follows along uh, in the next arena cycle. Can you ballpark for us, I'm just sort of curious to know, what is sort of the housing cost that comes with a project of this size? Like roughly how many housing units would we expect we would be asked to produce later on in the next cycle because of this growth of commercial? Yeah, I, I wish it was that simple. There's nothing predictable about the RENA process, um, much less you know at, at any level, whether it be what comes down from the state or how it's allocated from the um, from a bag. So it's a uh, um, it'd be really really hard to give any kind of quantification to that. Um, however, uh, we did kind of set the jobs housing linkage requirement roughly in line with what we expect the number, uh, you know, average number of employed residents per unit and average number of employees per office space. Um, and I believe that um, Ms. Whitehill has uh, that estimate of what this project would be responsible for under the jobs housing linkage requirement. Yeah, that's correct. So if this project was subject to jobs housing linkage, um, and it is grandfathered as are the other TDRs um, in East Wisman. Um, so if we included the 28,000 square feet of LASD TDR, um, the project would be responsible for 249 units, and that's representative of the three per 1,000 square feet. Um, and it could be reduced to 1.5 per 1,000 square feet, which would be approximately 125 units. Now, if we exclude the 28,000 square feet of TDR, um, the project, in theory, would have been responsible for 165 units or 83 affordable units. Perfect. Purely theoretical question. Thank you. Commissioner Cranston. Is the question for staff. Um, it was, wasn't clear as I looked through the, one of the things we'd hoped was to be able to try to preserve more of the heritage trees and it wasn't entirely clear were any saved or not through the process. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, so we were able to save um, an additional 13 heritage trees uh, since the EPC last reviewed this project. Um, those trees are indicated by the orange points on this diagram. Um, and that was largely due to um, the minor exceptions from the, the um, multi-use path standards. And you can see that there was also some changes to the, the replanting plan. So um, they'll be planting 220 new trees as opposed to the 173. Thank you. Commissioner Haymeyer. Thank you. I have a question for staff. Um, I was so pleased since we saw this last that it looks like the funding and planning is coming together for the Bernardo undercrossing. I wonder if you can maybe share, or if it's too premature, the sequencing of this project and when an anticipated undercrossing might open to service the employees at the, the new project site. I think that um, I'm actually going to defer to our colleague Ria in Public Works. Um, I think she's on the line if we can promote her. She's working on the undercrossing project. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so we're currently working on the undercrossing. We're working on the preliminary design. Um, and we expect to go into the full, so that will be a preliminary design and environmental review, and there will also be cost estimation as part of the present process. Um, after this 
we would go into um, full design. We have um, funding secured for the, the final design. Um, and the hope is that that would happen this year, um, which I think is a little ambitious, um, but assuming that takes a couple of years, then um, uh, the earliest that construction would happen is maybe like three years out. That would be the very earliest, but we we still need to secure funding for the construction phases. And there's a lot also that needs to happen in terms of relationship with Caltrain. So my assumption is that this development would happen first um, because the very earliest that we could do the construction of the undercrossing is several years out. Thank you. And in the staff report, it said something about um, Mountain View and Sunnyvale sharing those costs. Is that still the balance? It's a pretty big balance to, to cover. Yeah, so, so actually, um, the current project, which is the preliminary design, is a shared project between Mountain View and Sunnyvale. Sunnyvale actually initiated the project and um, Mountain View kind of joined in um, after the fact. And um, we have secured OBAG, uh, no, we have, sorry, we have secured um, some Measure B funding for uh, design and construction, um, which is uh, VTA, you know, uh, uh, ballot measure, uh, Measure B. Um, and then uh, Sunnyvale also secured some OBAG 2 funding for design. Um, we also secured some federal earmark um, money for, I think that is design as well. Um, so we're cobbling together different, uh, you know, different pieces of uh, funding. But so far, the project has been led by Sunnyvale in very close collaboration with Mountain View. Um, uh, because this goes underneath the Caltrain tracks, the design and construction would need to be led by Caltrain. Thank you. Commissioner Nunes. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, first comment, just kind of piggybacking off something Commissioner Dempsey um, opened up with um, that totally had gone over my head. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I had a look up what bocce was. Um, had I, Yeah, so to the extent that, um, you know, the applicant is aware of the best practices that, you know, facilitate people knowing um, or being able to be guided towards knowing that they can use that community benefit for something that is obviously um, something they're able to do with it, in particular something that's highly demanded uh, by our residents in terms of recreation. I totally support that comment um, so that people don't just think they're standing in the middle of a rectangle. Um, but uh, this question uh, for staff, I would say, um, to what extent did the DRC assess the expectation, possibility, uh, that there might be some glare that might uh, occur for motorists going down Central Expressway? And to what extent would that be, you know, either like extreme, not at all, maybe during what times of the day, if at all? So I, I don't believe that the DRC assessed glare in great detail as part of their design review. Um, I, you know, I will say that the, I, I'm not sure if that's maybe something that the architect can speak to or. But in general, um, sorry, Diana Pincholi, principal planner with the planning division. But in general, you know, whenever we are reviewing such projects with, um, you know, such architectural style, that is always a consideration whether we are specifically discussing that um, um, point blank or not, but that's always a consideration. So um, th thank you. So if it was a consideration, what are the kind of outputs that uh, come from that consideration in terms of like either measurables or assessment or report? And, and the reason why I bring this up is because, um, you know, when I've been driving down Central Expressway through cities that shall not be named, I have had to you know, and it, I just would not want either the city to get complaints about this, you know, five years from now or far less have someone actually get hurt because they, you know. Staff totally understands um, 
you know, where you come from and um, the intent of the comment. Uh, we definitely look at the materiality of um, the kind of glass or the material that is being proposed. I wonder if the project architect or applicant has to add more to that. Yes, thank you. Um, we did talk about that at DRC level early on in the stage. Um, two things for this glass. One, it is clear glass. It is not reflective in any way. Um, that's number one. Number two, it's also bird safe design. So we looked at both of those issues very early on. And I, I don't think you're gonna have any of that, um, that type of issue that you're thinking. Uh, some of those other buildings on Central, as you know, are a little older and they were more reflective. Yeah. I totally believe that we would learn our mistakes from the 70s and 80s and such. Um, that said, just in case, for some weird reason, things are glaring. Um, is this a situation where the applicant would be responsible for any kind of like after the fact remediation work or is that something like what would be the city's recourse if there was, which I don't expect there would be, but if there was like who would be the median? At this point of time, we don't have any conditions to bring it back. Uh, somehow, you know, once the project has been developed, the rights have been vested, we don't have any um, recourse measures built into the conditions of approval. Okay. Is that even a thing? Did, is that like, like glare assessment? Is that anything that is typically done as part of like design and review considerations? We do it, you know, as we mentioned earlier, we do it during the DRC review process, um, but not after the fact. Okay. Okay. Um, I, um, I will just add one more thing. We do learn from lessons from previously designed and constructed buildings. So. Absolutely. Was the expectation. I just have to ask the questions. Um, cool. Uh, and then uh, last kind of line of thinking here, just in terms of uh, the community benefit, um, I think it was like 3.6 or something million for the schools um, and then 1.3 for, you know, the underpassing. Um, with regards to that 3.6 million, um, is that something that the school district and the developer negotiate between themselves? And we're only, okay. So then with regards to that 1.3 million, um, is that adjusted for inflation? Or is it the same 1.3 from like 2019, basically? So yeah, there is a, a dollar per square foot fee that is adjusted for inflation with the annual budget process. So the 1.3 million, um, that accounts for inflation. Thank you. I see no other questions. I will. Oh. Sorry. No, I, I don't know if mine's yeah. working. I, I don't know. I'm so sorry. I, no, I, I'm I, sorry. I didn't catch your clue. I, I, Please go good. ahead. Yeah. Um, just to follow up on the glass glare question, and I'm sure you have this information on hand. The type of glass that you all are using now, I'm thinking has been used before. If it has been, do you know of any situation where the glare was an issue using this type of modern glass? And if so, where or how did you deal with that? We are uh, familiar with the glass. And uh, no, I have not heard of any problems that it has. It's, it's a clear glass. It is not reflective in any way. It will not reflect glass or light that way. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I just had a, a couple questions myself. Um, and just during the presentation, um, it occurred to me. Uh, thank you for making sure there's a little bit more green space from the last iteration. Um, I do see that there's still a lot of hardscape. Uh, and I was curious if you guys looked at porous pavers to, to ensure that water flow would at least seep down um, instead of just run off. I didn't know if that was a consideration. And if you looked into that in Yes, we have incorporated permeable paving into the design and a lot of the pedestrian areas to help improve that uh, water penetration. Great, thank you. Um, and then I know that the Dark Skies Initiative is something that is gonna be coming. Um, and so because it's coming, I didn't know if maybe there was discussion about that given the glass comments here. I was wondering um, if that would be something that you looked at for operations and management, like rolling the blinds down so that it's not just a, a glass box that's glowing. Um, 
So uh, maybe that's first a question for our staff and the presenters of or, or applicants. Yeah, we we don't have any specific um, defined regulations in place right now, but you know, to the best of staff's knowledge, whatever. We have heard and we have learned through, you know, different pieces coming together. We have ensured that, you know, we check for that. But as I mentioned earlier, we don't have specific regulations in place, so there's nothing that we can be, it can be required. Well then, for the applicant, are you familiar with it and whether or not you guys had um, looked into it? So I, I don't know these regulations off the top of my head, no, but I generally know they're coming. They've, these have been decades in the making. And, and in, in terms of the lights going on and off or whether blinds are going down, that's really a function of the tenant and an operational issue. So the lights are supposed to be off. Everything's supposed to be on automatic timers. That's actually California building code at this point. Um, so I know every once in a while when, on, when we're driving around, we see a glass office building at 11 o'clock at night where the lights are somehow burning bright and it looks like everybody's at work even though no one is at work. So, and that's a problem and that needs to be fixed from the tenant operation end. That's the bottom line. So whether we have blinds or not, really when, when there's no one in the office, the light should be off. Just like all of our offices here and these are much older buildings. So that's sort of the bottom line. We haven't looked at light sort of intruding off the site specifically. Um, but yeah, the, light, the lights need to be turned off. So if that answers your question. Sure, that, and that helps. A, and, if, and that's if, probably a continuous follow-up with virtually any right. tenant in any office building just about anywhere. So. Yeah, and knowing that the city cares about that, if you don't mind yeah. noting it to the tenants that are coming through. That, that's Absolutely. Important. Yeah, Thank and you. we do have some of those issues in other tenants in other cities, and it's the same thing where we have sort of our asset managers remind them, hey, these, the timers need to be on. They're generally not even controlled in the building. A lot of the newer timers are controlled by off-site companies. So. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Seeing no more questions, we will turn it over to public comment. Um, APC Clerk Penelar, do you see any? Um, yes, we do have one virtual speaker, um, Celia. So one moment, please. Um. Hi. Um, oh, one moment, please, I'm Celia. Oh, uh, sorry. Let me yeah. uh, put the timer on. Sure. Okay, you should be able to start now. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Celia Pamer, uh, representative of Green Spaces Mountain View. I appreciate the discussion about dark skies that was just happening. Um, to add on to that, um, uh, the considerations for the exterior lights, hopefully um, there are uh, international dark skies recommendations for exterior lighting um, for the paths and for the green spaces. So I hope you look into those. Um, they also should um, dim significantly when no one's walking by and then have motion sensors so they turn brighter someone comes by it's improved safety and also reduces lighting when it's not needed um, so i hope you consider that for the outside space um, and uh, thank you i can see that a lot of uh, comments have been implemented i appreciate it are there any other speakers from zoom if no other speakers. Okay. Sorry, I did not uh, do the introduction to how you <laughs> uh, get on Zoom, but I, I'm going to assume that there are no more, so don't need to repeat it. Um, now I'll then ask the commissioners to go ahead and deliberate, and we can take action after deliberation. Commissioner Clark. You know, so I, I'll just say I, I, I can't believe it's been a year since the last meeting, but um, but thank you very much to you and to staff too and, and the DRC for being responsive to our comments. Um, I think, you know, there there are always trade offs with 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 anything here, and I think in this case it's it's mostly the trees, unfortunately. But um, I I'm encouraged that we were able to find additional trees we were able to save, um, and I think some of the impacts. Um, are of our own making uh, with with requiring the uh, the multi-use trail. It looked like a, a, a several trees had to come out for that. So, but I'm I'm glad that we were able to make some exception uh, some exceptions to our our uh, the the trail width and a few other things to accommodate some additional trees. Um, I know that's not the only reason their trees are being removed, the garage and everything else. But um, but but overall, um, I really appreciate you being um, responsive uh, to to the comments that were 
that, that we made and that DRC made. And um, I'll go ahead and uh, others can, can chime in too, but I'll, I'll go ahead and just move the staff recommendation as printed in the staff report. I see Commissioner Nunez has seconded. So we can go ahead and take a vote unless. Commissioner Gutierrez, oh, thank you. additional comments? One more comment, yes. I, I wanted to also not just thank you for taking the time to show the community what you had listened to us, uh, our concerns about were with the uh, bicycle situation, and you pointed out where these changes were made and how they were made, and, and that's appreciated. But I also want to take notice of and give you credit for the rooftop uh, garden setting, the at, that outdoor setting. It may not show too much in terms of the results, in terms of the measurables that we look for for green space and what have you at a certain type of level. Or, um, but nonetheless, it's, it's important for the office environment to have something else to look forward to and to have there that incorporates nature because I can tell you having worked in an office community for like the last 18, 20 years, anything that's associated with outside and greenery is, is much appreciated because we don't have enough of it and we have something here now, so thank you. Okay, shall we take the vote? Motion carries unanimously with Chris Clark um, motioning it and the second from Nunez. Thank you. Now we are going to move to our second agenda item, which is the advisory body input on the fiscal years 2023 to 24 and 2024 to 25 council work plan potential projects. We will first have a staff presentation, then questions by the EPC, followed by public comment. At the closure of public comment, the commission will then deliberate and provide their priority projects. Staff presentation will be by Laurel James, Principal Management Analyst. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Give me one moment to get my slides up so that folks Certainly. can see. Certainly. Yeah. Do we need any assistance, perhaps? Thank you for your patience. All right, I'm here this evening Commission, and again, thank you for your patience, to discuss with you the fiscal years 23 through 24 and 24 through 25 council work plan potential projects. The council work plan is developed every two years in order to guide the allocation of staff resources and identify projects that are of particular interest to council that advance the council's strategic priorities in a substantive or significant way and require significant city resources, particularly staff time, to complete. 
The council places projects on the work plan in order to facilitate focus and visibility on those projects through regular updates, prioritize resource allocation, particularly staff time, and allow council to easily monitor the progress of those projects. The goal here is to balance responsiveness to councils and communities' priorities with the ability to effectively plan staff time and work over the course of a significant period, particularly because, as you know, the city does work on several long-term projects. At the February 28th council meeting, the council identified 42 potential projects for the fiscal year 23 through 25 work plan. That included 20 carry forward projects from the fiscal years 21 through 23 work plan, as well as 10 projects that were already be considered for this implementation time period, and 12 projects that were proposed by the council during that study session. And today we're asking to hear your highest priority projects from that list of 42. So those projects are all intended to, again, advance council strategic priorities, which are displayed here on the screen for you today. Staff will be providing the council with an analysis of the project's impact on advancing those strategic priorities, along with an analysis of the impact on staff capacity, the project's alignment with race equity and inclusion goals that have been outlined by council, the timeliness or urgency of that project, and any dependencies or ways in which that project facilitates additional staff resources in the future. Here you have, as well as included in the staff report, a review of the process and timeline for this work plan development, as well as the check-ins once that work plan is adopted. Uh, we're right in between three and four, and the council has asked staff to attend council advisory body meetings this month to share this list of projects and to, again, hear the highest priority projects from each advisory body. That feedback will be summarized and provided to council at the April 25th meeting, along with the staff analysis I just described, to help guide council's prioritization of those 42 projects. And the reason why we have this discussion is because, as we know, there's limited staff capacity at the city, and the primary responsibilities of most staff include core services, things like fighting fires, keeping the water running, repairing potholes or down trees are most of what we do. And the special projects that we do include council work plan projects, but they also include other required or planned projects like implementing the housing element, um, completing capital improvements projects, of which there are many. And this is one way of, again, prioritizing that scarce, scarce resource of staff time. So what the project prioritization will look like that you'll be informing on that April 25th meeting will be three different categories that these 42 projects fall into. Category A will include the highest priority projects, which would be considered first in staff allocation and planning and should be begun or gotten underway as soon as possible. B would be high priority projects considered after category A in staff allocation and planning but still intended to start and make significant headway in that two-year implementation period. And C would be priority projects to be worked on as time and resources allow. Um, there are some projects that council members suggested and immediately identified as phase three, specifically, for example, updating the municipal code to remove redundant or unenforceable clauses. So with that said, the proposed process for today's discussion is to have questions for staff, um, public comment, as you know. These are the same slides that I've used for every council advisory body and to help guide the discussion. I know you are very familiar with this process. And then the third is to develop a recommendation and staff's proposal is that each commissioner will share up to 10 projects that they've identified as most important. Staff, I will record responses to identify a collective or aggregated 10 uh, and then we'd have discussion to forward the recommendation to council. With that said, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I figure we're going to have EPC questions. And if you don't mind, we'll do questions about the process, how we're going to go about this first, if you have any. And if none, we will move into just questions or other general questions. Um, and then 
individual project questions if you have any. Does that make sense? Yeah, we'll do a one run through of process questions, and if there are no more, then we'll go into the specific project questions. Sure. Commissioner Clark. Do you, is the assumption that these are the 42 things, the 42 things will remain 42 things and we just want to prioritize or are you interested in um, maybe just don't bother with that and use staff resources for other things? <laughs> if, if the 42 <laughs> things are just, if it's really just reordering the 42 and you don't want us to act as council members and be like, make it 39, then we won't, but, or at least I won't, but, but I, I did have a few things on that. But. Thank you. Um, I believe that these are the 42 projects that council has expressed interest in, so they will likely end up um, in the council work plan unless there's some counterindication that comes from the staff recommendation or analysis. Um, so I would recommend prioritizing the projects that do exist. Okay. Um, Commissioner Cranston, you have questions on process? So could we suggest that something should fall into bucket C? <laughs> well, that isn't the charge of today's meeting. If you do have comments like that, I am happy to record them and include them in the summary. Okay. And then I'm not sure whether this is a process question, but I'll ask it anyway. Some of the, you mentioned the housing element. Some of the items that are in here are within the housing element. I didn't necessarily view those as discretionary once the state commits to those and so I was somewhat confused by the inclusion of some of these in this list and whether those should be items that need to be prioritized since we're kind of committing to the state to do those. Thank you for the question and I invite our planning manager to interrupt me if I get something wrong. Um, but I believe that the intent is that the housing element is for a time frame of eight years. Um, and there are many projects contained therein, and it's still of interest and worthwhile to the council to prioritize the implementation of those projects. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, you know, the, the commissioner is well aware that there are some projects in the housing element that we have to do before the eight years, so in the next two years. Um, I, part of the role, I think, and of course the, um, uh, Ms. James can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think part of the role of the council work plan is to give council some ownership over projects, even if they're also required, right? And it, and it can um, be um, uh, kind of provide that additional um, guidance to staff uh, about the, the nature of the priority and the, the nature of, of what council's looking for from staff. So giving, giving the... Um, uh, this process can include projects that are otherwise required, and there may be projects that are otherwise required that aren't part of this process. It's really um, a very council-led uh, process. Okay. Um, oh, Commissioner Nunez, you had a process question? Please. So uh, just to... Um kind of go off of what Commissioner Cranston mentioned. Um, in terms of comment recording to council, like if, you know, clearly understanding the intent is not, you know, we're gonna in any way say, hey, we think this should be added or this should be changed or what have you. Um, is it still like ballpark to say, hey, we're looking at, you know, project line number X and it says this, you know, if four people agree, that maybe council should consider that it might, you know, like include this, for example, is that within the scope of the process? So like not, we're recommending you change it, but more like recommending you think about a possible, you know, like addition or modification. Thank you for your question. Yes, other commissions and committees have provided limited direction as to considering in inclusion of particular elements 
in some of those projects. So for example, the Performing Arts Committee suggested that the Performing Arts Center be a part of the project uh, working on revi downtown vibrancy, um, including performances and the pedestrian mall. So there have been some suggestions along those lines that have been recorded, yes. No other process questions? Then we will move on to specific questions to the items or project list, if anyone has any. Commissioner Clark. Oh, no, is that the old one? Sorry. No questions? Oh. Vice Chair Dempsey, sorry. Okay, I, I have somewhat of an arcane question. Um, pertaining to item 20 and 22, um, the local road, road safety vision zero action plan and the safe routes to school program. I imagine those overlap somewhat. So if you can tease the two apart for me. Absolutely, you're correct in noting that they're certainly related. The local road safety vision zero action plan is very much focused on infrastructure um, throughout the city for particularly bikes and pedestrians, but also vehicles to reduce vehicular accidents and with a goal of zero fatalities. And Project 22, Expanding the Safe Roads to School program, includes um, more of an education element, including visiting schools, um, explaining road safety, creating maps, laying out routes, and infrastructure improvements along those specific routes. So while there is some overlap, they are two separate programs um, with two separate approaches to similar goals. Commissioner Kristen. Item 19 is a grade separation, but it also says continue to implement the transit center master plan. Is this goal both, or are they two different things? Excellent question. They're related. In the fiscal year 21 through 23 work plan, there was an item that was continue to implement the transit center master plan with no further explanation. Um, and the staff recommendation for this work plan was to focus on a specific project that continued to implement the transit center master plan with a goal of more transparency around that, how, was, how that was being done. There are other elements of the transit center master plan that aren't listed here as potential goals? That's correct, and this is largely based on the timing of the different elements, so this would be the one that would be most appropriate for fiscal year 23 through 25. Commissioner Nunez. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at projects uh, 34, 35, and 36. In particular, 34 and 36. Um, I'm kind of curious about, um, sim yeah, if you could also kind of highlight some of the differences. I imagine 36 might be generally across the city. Um, I don't know to what extent. Um, storefront activation is or isn't as problematic uh, a focus right now um, as opposed to like the downtown, for example. Um, so to the extent that, you know, you can help me understand the difference between those projects, I would really appreciate that. Absolutely. Project 34, um, implementing strategies for a vibrant downtown, would include the beginning phases of implementing the Castro Pedestrian Mall as directed by council, as well as some space activation projects that will include performances, um, music, and other elements that our community services department would be organizing. Number 36, which is developing a comprehensive storefront activation program, would be a citywide program, as you note, um, with the goal of enhancing what might be considered a traditional facade improvement program to include some design guidance and elements um, so that those facades would have a little bit more of a cohesiveness and some direction as to the expectations. Excuse me. Um, and so then the economic vitality strategic plan is, sorry if I missed that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the economic vitality strategic plan is currently in the process of being completed and will be brought to council. Um, and it will have multiple projects 
that are focused on citywide economic vitality. Um, I can't speak to what those specific projects might be, and, but they may, as I'm guessing you're um, sensing, overlap with those other two projects as well. And, and would that be um, like broadly speaking in terms of encapsulating anything from a small business up to, you know, like huge tenants like Google, Microsoft, um, in terms of like employment, like what are, um, not specific projects, but like what's the, like how broad is the scope of that project? That's an excellent question that I don't have an immediate answer for. Um, perhaps our planning manager may know. Yeah, I, I've been working with Mr. Lang a little bit on this. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't have a really good sense of the scope other than it is a very broad <laughs> scoped uh, project. Um, it is going to be going to council in the next couple of months with a, a check in a study session. And so, um, you know, it, doesn't help you right now, but if you're curious, you'll you'll you um, you know you, you'll get some of your questions answered there. Um, but at this point, what I've seen is that it's um, related to uh, issues of supporting small businesses and business vitality and making sure that they can you know grow and prosper. Related to issues of retail demand. Uh, related to issues of. Um, um, you know, how well do uh, some of our standards um, kind of support the, the business environment? So it, there, in, in all likelihood, there will be outcomes from the strategy that will inform, you know, your purview, zoning updates and, and general plan amendments and the like. So um, it is something that I do recommend you, you keep an eye on. Um, and then uh, last, uh, hopefully question, maybe question and a half. Um, so with regards to uh, projects uh, number 10 and 7, 7 and 10, um, my understanding, um, just from speaking um, with some of the council people as well in terms of the feedback that I'm, I'm, I'm getting, is that the um, uh, R3 rezoning and the anti-displacement uh, strategy uh, are uh, really uh, intended to kind of inform one each other and, and be very intertwined in terms of, um, you know, one begetting the other. Um, and so to the extent that, um, because, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be a little more um, clear. So w what I'm really hoping for in terms of item number 10 in particular um, is more displacement prevention than, like, response or mitigation. Um, and so a lot of that obviously will have to do with, like, um, whether or not people are able to come to a place um, to maintain the residency in the city. And so my question is... Um, to what extent uh, are these two items linked um, in the approach that staff is taking in, um, yeah, it, with regard to these two items? Yeah, that, that's a really, really big question, and it's something that we are talking about all the time uh, between my team and, and Wayne's team in, in the housing division. So. Um, I, I can't give you too much at this point because it is a work in process, but you're, you're absolutely correct that they are joined at the hip. Um, the outcomes of the anti-displacement strategy need to inform R3 and vice versa. So um, the, the process is we're, we're going to be going to council with the anti-displacement strategy framework uh, in a couple of months here um, to a study session. And so that can kind of help inform um, where council's priorities are. That can can also help inform how they're linked in the in the R three project. But it, you know, in terms of which comes first, which is the cart, which is the horse, they're they're so deeply, deeply intertwined. It's it's not a quick and easy answer. Then um, this is the half question. Um, what's the reasoning for them being separate projects versus just one? 
Well, because they both cover a lot of territory outside of each other, right? It's a Venn diagram. There's a lot of overlap, but then there's a lot of territory outside. Um, you know, the one of the big goals of the R3 project is updating our development standards. So, you know, um, kind of a taking a form-based approach, so really rethinking how we do, um, you know, development relative to, to those standards. Um, the anti-displacement um, uh, project, as you said, has not just prevention, but potentially also mitigation, potentially also, um, you know, finding um, uh, properties, uh, you know, the, the whole replacement process, you know, the SB 330 replacement process, finding properties that we can acquire uh, to, to move people into, um, you know, the TREO, that's, all of this other stuff that's just kind of not necessarily the nuts and bolts of zoning uh, related. So they really are, they're, it's, a, it's a Venn diagram. There's a lot that's outside of the other one. Um, and so I, it is appropriate that they're separate. Commissioner Gutierrez. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so um, I have a question in terms of 22. Uh, I'm, I'm in support of expanding the school safe routes and all that comes with it. And, and my question is, and, and I don't know if, if, if this is applicable or not, but uh, if, if it's not, I'll still send an email. Uh, to, to council for sure, right? As a, as, a, as a citizen of Mountain View and a registered voter, hey, this is what I think. But um, for, for that, I would appreciate, here's the question. Because I don't know the specifics of the plan per se, I have, I'm familiar with some of it, but not all of it, of what you are considering. So here's the question. Would it be possible to include electronic signage at Grant and El Camino that would read watch for school commuters? Because I know uh, it's been about a year uh, since my friend, or Elanita's, my daughter's friend, Andre, passed away. So I'd appreciate if you could relay that, because this does affect our community in different manners. And that's one way where I think we can make a difference if it's considered as a top 10. Hey, let's include this. Is it possible? So I'd, uh, we would appreciate that very much. Thank you. I'll make note of it for the council. More questions from the commissioners. I have a couple. Um, here we go. So I am under the impression dark skies are going to be done in the biodiversity strategy, and council will see that soon. Is that correct? So the biodiversity strategy is one of the projects that's closer to completion. That's one of the carry forwards. And the dark skies ordinance may be one of the recommendations that comes out of that strategy. Um, it is also included as a project on this list because there is specific interest from council in seeing it accelerated, um, if that was the case. Okay. And I had a question earlier about the carry forward projects. I am under the um, impression that a lot of them are underway and without knowing you know, how large these projects are, how much time's involved, the efficiencies of just moving it forward versus, you know, highlighting something else. So, you know, because we don't know all that, well, I personally don't know that. Um, I was just curious if you wouldn't mind, uh, I was gonna ask, you know, to, to sort of let us know which ones are almost complete, but maybe the opposite question would be more helpful. Which ones haven't started in our kind of, more in the planned category rather than underway or carry forward? That's an excellent question. Um, and I have a, only a nuanced answer for that. Um, all of the council proposed projects and the planned fiscal year 23 through 25 projects are not currently substantively underway. The projects uh, that are carry forward of those m most are substantively underway um, there are a couple that have not yet started but will be started shortly uh, they include the 
Community Workforce Agreement. Um, and I believe the, apologies. I actually believe that is the number one one that was not underway. Um, additionally, there are some that are on a timeline. So obviously the two projects that are related to ballot measures um, are on a specific timeline and may be prioritized, but that won't necessarily speed them up or slow them down. And the uh, shoreline area plan update is planned to be complete by the end of calendar year 2023. So that is the best response that I can give to that question. Okay, thank you very much. Let me just find the number for those. Uh, I can provide that if that's helpful. Oh, I got it. I think it's 40 and 12 and number two. And, and 42, yes. Oh, 42? Mm -hmm. oh, let me see. And 42. Okay. Thank you. So no more questions on the topics? Then uh, I think we will go to public comment. Um, if anyone in attendance would like to provide comments on this item, please fill out a yellow speak. Well, if there's no one here, I can probably forgo that. If anyone on Zoom would like to provide a comment on this item, please click the raise hand button in Zoom or press star nine on your phone. Phone users can mute and unmute themselves with star six. EPC clerk, do you happen to see anyone? Yeah, I do have one speaker, um, Celia. So, uh, one second. Hey, Celia, you should be able to speak now. Okay, hi, uh, again, Celia Pamer, Green Spaces, Mountain View. Um, honestly, looking at this list, I don't know how I would pick top 10. There's so many things on there that are important, and I'm sure as commissioners, um, your prioritization will be around um, your position as well. I did want to point out two that might be um, fall under the radar, as you mentioned, the dark sky ordinance. Um, I think this is a place where developers would really like clarity when they're designing, um, as we saw it kind of came up tonight, and we wouldn't want um, developers to have to worry about what that wording is going to look like before their plans are done. Um, while it uh, will likely be in the biodiversity plan, it, that has not even started the um, community input component yet. So it's probably at least a year out for completion. And even at that point, that won't write the ordinance. It will just recommend that we write an ordinance. Um, so that'll still need to be written and be on a work plan, I guess, maybe in 2025, 20, 26. Um, so if you would like to give that clarity to developers sooner rather than later, I would recommend prioritizing it. Um, the other thing um, that I didn't hear brought up was the possibility of a revenue measure, number 40. Um, I did miss your last meeting, I apologize, and didn't get a chance to listen to it. Um, but through the grapevine, I heard maybe a possible reduction in park and loo fees. And as we increase housing and density, we're gonna have more and more people that do not have their own yard space and green space. And we'll be looking for walkable green spaces, places they can walk to from their front door, throwing kids in the car is a pain in the butt. So um, if we're gonna have more park space, we have to find some way to fund that if we're not gonna be charging developers for it. And I understand that balance of priorities, but we need to have more park space as we have more people. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. So would the commissioners like to begin with their list? <laughs> Can I just ask staff, so um, in other commissions or advisory bodies, how what has been the most effective way? So people go around and say, here are my top 10, and then we look for overlap. Is that my yes, numbers? That's, that's um, how it's been done. You can read the number, and I'll record it, or if you wanted to read the name of the project, either one is fine. Commissioner okay. Clark. Yeah, I can I can start. Um, so the way that I, uh, just because I didn't list something doesn't necessarily mean I think it's important. I, the way that I did this um, from a strategic perspective was looking at what things are probably likely to happen regardless of whether 
I prioritize them or not um, because they're maybe already in progress or moving forward. And I really looked at things that I think are important that might not otherwise get prioritized if they're if they're not put forward as part of this process. Um, uh, so that's that's why I focus on it. And, and most of and I mostly focused on you know, things that I think are really important that happen as opposed to like things that I would like to happen but are probably in the grand scheme of things nice to have, except for there's one uh, one pet peeve here. <laughs> You'll see at the end, but um, cause I, I'd like to elevate and just make sure it still happens. But I would say um, item one, the homelessness um, response strategy. Um, I think um, you know implementing that um, will, will be important. Um, completing R3 um, as, as part of the, the housing element process. Um, the VTA housing um, site, I think is important. The um, displacement response strategy um, and, and the implementation of that uh, is important. The downtown precise plan, the, um, I think the revamp of the gatekeeper process, um, since that's been added to the housing element, um, this was flagged by a few council members, I think the uh, continuing safe routes to schools, obviously, um, as Commissioner Gutierrez rightly pointed out. Um, all right, that was 22. Um, uh, um, the gatekeeper process was 14. Um, downtown precise plan was 13. Displacement response was 10. Um, BTA housing was eight and uh, R3 was seven. Um, and I'll keep going. Uh, and then the 26, the decarbonization plan um, and the implementation of that. The um, implementation of the economic vitality um, initiative uh, that's going on, that's 35. And then um, if it isn't for certain happening, online permitting number 39, um, it's been something I've wanted forever, but that also falls into the nice to have category. So those are, those are my initial 10. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gutierrez. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. So I have, I think I have like about nine. I'll, I'll list them out uh, for now. Um, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, 22, 34, 35. Um, so let's see. So eight is facilitate affordable housing development at the VTA Evelyn site. Nine is begin development of a Moffat Boulevard precise plan. 11 is develop a strategy to facilitate low and middle income housing ownership. Uh, 12 is review and update the Shoreline Community Shoreline Area Plan. Uh, 14 is review and update the gatekeeper process. Uh, 10, which I mistakenly uh, skipped over, I apologize for that. Implement development response strategy actions. Um, and then let's see, just to round these out. Uh, 22, expand the safe routes to school program um, with a question that was posed to you as well and relaying the uh, request to have possibly signage electronic at Grant and El Camino indicating in the morning and afternoon hours of school commuters beware or watch for school commuters. commuters. Uh, and then 34, implement strategies for a vibrant downtown including the Castro uh, Pedestrian Mall. Uh, 35, begin implementation of the economic vitality strategy plan with multiple projects in mind. Um, and then, uh, no one really asked for this, but um, I'm throwing one out there just to see what happens, but uh, 43, in my opinion, would be uh, the city to take ownership of having more park space. Uh, they should rely less on the school districts for that, and they should provide that on their own, because I think that we can do that as a community in all of our neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Okay, now we have Vice Chair Dempsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my theory is I did this because I I, I, Commissioner Clark said it well. Um, there's a lot of good things in here, and there's a lot more than 10, so it's a little hard. To, it's like picking between your children. Um, what I did is I picked one for each strategic priority, and then I had three extras that I that I sort of threw around and it's often reflective of what I hear folks that I run into you know in town talking about so for me it was a sort of a measure of of interest energy and intensity my picks were number one 
uh, comprehensive homelessness response strategy. And number five, exploring strategies for uh, supporting renters not under uh, CISPRA. That was my community for all choices. For um, development of housing, I had seven, which is looking at R3, and 10, which is displacement response. Then for mobility, uh, my winners were um, 16, the TDM, citywide TDM, and of course 22, the uh, safe routes to school. That one's important. For sustainability and climate, I picked 25, uh, community tree master plan. For livability and quality of life, um, actually I thought 32, holistic citywide review of parking regs was worth doing. For economic vitality, 34, which is uh, implementing strategies for vibrant downtown. I think that one's really important. And there's a lot of folks that have been thinking about that and paying attention to it. Um, finally, uh, for organizational strength and good governance, um, shout out to Chris, because I also like online permitting systems, so uh, 39 as well. Commissioner Haymeyer. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing a lot of overlap. I had um, one for homelessness, seven for R3, like Commissioner Clark, eight for VTA Evelyn, um, nine for Moffitt, 10 for displacement, 13, and I could see maybe some conversation about 13 and 34 for a downtown. Um, 19, thinking about the, the grade, separ grade separation at Castro, 26 for decarbonization, perhaps a friendly amendment to Commissioner Gutierrez's comment about park spaces. I don't think anyone has said 30 so far about the Parks and Rec master plan, um, which might fit in under that. 35 for economic vitality, and then 39 for online permitting. So I know that's 11. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Nunes. I might not give my full 10. I'll give the ones that I'm super sure of. This is really hard. Um, all right, well, I'll start uh, with number one uh, for sure is, uh, number one, develop comprehensive homeless, homelessness response strategy. Um, the R3, so uh, item number seven, um, proposed revisions to that. Um, item number nine, uh, the Moffitt Boulevard precise plan. Uh, number 10, the uh, implement displacement response. Uh, number 11, the develop a strategy to facilitate uh, low and middle income housing. Um, number 20, uh, the vision zero, so I'm torn really between um, this one and the safe schools just because of how, the, the safe school routes just because of how much it seems to me like these intertwine. Um, I'm going to choose number 20 because it appears to me to be uh, more encompassing and um, the comprehensive approach to um, pedestrian and, and, and I guess probably also like basically transit safety. So I'm hoping that any gains made there in terms of safety will just cascade down into you know, routes that people are taking to school. Um, I think I have seven or six. Um, I am supportive of the exploring the feasibility of the 2024 revenue measure, so that would be item number 40. Um, number 35 as well, with regards to the economic vitality plan. Um, so I'm also going with that one in the expectation that it will um, have some sort of project or provisions that will address downtown storefront um, vacancies um, and that kind of um, uh, you know matter right now. Um, I'm torn. Uh, one of the ones that I uh, none of my colleagues have mentioned yet is um, item number 15, downtown, downtown office cap. Um, you know that would be one where um, you know 
I, I mean, it came up in the last um, item. I would be curious, uh, you know, and keen to like, you know, even tag a note to council. Maybe I'll just talk to him. I don't know. Um, saying, hey, you know, why limit this to downtown? Why not look at um, a comprehensive citywide, you know, jobs to housing linkage or moratorium? Basically, just um, the amount of commercial space um, I find problematic. So. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go for that one, um, the downtown office cap. So I'm actually talking myself into 10. Um, all right, last one. I'm going to go with uh, number 42, place a measure on the 2024 ballot to amend the city charter, uh, cleanup and modernization. All right, go out to 10. OK. Commissioner Gretzen, you ready? You just sat in my last two, huh? Yeah. So, number one, um, number seven, what are three? Uh, number 10. Thirteen, the long-term precise plan, and fourteen, the gatekeeper process. Um, nobody else mentioned these, but I'm going to add twenty-seven, the climate change vulnerability assessment. I feel like they've been climated a lot the last couple of months. Um, I don't know whether we're ready for it, and the dark skies initiative ordinance. I would add, and then. I guess I view 34 as kind of different than the others. So I had 34 with the downtown, the, the, the 35, the economic vitality strategy, and another one that's not mentioned that kind of came up in the housing element was the public services study, number 37. I don't feel like we've adequately looked at our police and fire needs and so forth. Okay, thank you. So I did not have a set number of 10 and uh, because I wanted to hear the questions, I want to hear what other people said and I wish I had a couple minutes to myself so I could rearrange my list here now that I know what has majority votes already. <laughs> so I um, am not 100% sure here what's already got the four votes that will go through. If you guys don't mind just Going over those, that'd be great. Absolutely. Project one, developing a comprehensive homelessness response strategy. Project seven, the R3 zone updates. Project 10, implementing displacement response strategy actions. Project 34, implementing strategies for a vibrant downtown. And project 35, beginning implementation of the economic vitality strategic plan. Okay, thank you so much. So my sort of thinking when I was going through this one was, I, I know there's limited staff time that we're all very aware of. Um, and it was very hard to pick uh, a slew here. Um, I'm gonna have to move these around a bit. Um, I also, ha I know we've been doing the housing element for quite a while, and I know all those are going to be moving forward. So. There was a balance for me of you know knowing that these are going to get done anyways, regardless of what what we put out. Um, and the the upside is that there is eight years to do it, and so I went ahead and took advantage of the fact that it has eight years. Uh, but there were a couple that I wanted to highlight because in the housing element, I feel like it's weighted very strongly towards density. And in fact, there was policy in there to remove like park funding. I know there's a nexus study involved, but um, I'm just concerned. I, you know, I'm broadly supportive of the ideas and concepts in the housing element. I just worry about the execution and the unintended consequences of this ginormous policy document. Uh, so I did highlight a few that um, I think might balance out what we need for a functioning city with all this density. In addition, I sprinkled some 
others here and there. So here, let me attempt this. Um, one was already done, 10, okay. I am going to go for the City Active Transportation Ordinance. Did you which, give a number? I'm sorry. sorry, 17. Yes, I was going to ask everybody else to do that and forgot myself. 17, 30. I think those two go hand in hand, I believe, in, in a sense. So um, can I put them just in one? And that's I have nine left over. Cheater. <laughs> um, I, like Commissioner Nunez, also hope that with Vision Zero implementation, we would have safe routes to school. <laughs> um, that's my hope. So uh, I'm going for 20. Oh, if I have um, that's three. I am a big believer in precise plans. I know this is heavy on the planning department, um, but because we have so much development potential coming, um, the, the best way I can see trying to manage it is through a precise plan. So number nine and the downtown precise plan, I believe, was in there. What number was that? 15, I think. 13, yes. There it is. Um, there was a new one that I thought was interesting, since it's only me. I'm not sure it's going to go through, but I'm going to put out there the exploring or the exploration of applying for the county grants for child care. How many is that now? Sorry, I'm not keeping track of my own. Six. Da, da, da. And we have the community tree master plan. Seven, uh, 25. Um, I was looking at the downtown office cap as well. Mm -hmm. The economic vitality, oh, I'm sorry, that one already went through, right? Yes, that one went through. So, gatekeeper, did gatekeeper go through? No, gatekeeper, Nine. 14. Um, number 40, the 2024 revenue measure. Darn, that's 10. Okay, if I had room, it would be the online permitting system too. But, all right. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Chair. Doing the tally, uh, <laughs> the final tally, thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm ready to share those that have received majority support. Uh, project one, again, the homelessness response strategy. Project seven, which is R3 zoning. Project nine, development of a Moffitt Boulevard precise plan. Project 10, displacement response strategy. Project 13, the downtown precise plan. Project 14, gatekeeper process. Project 34, the vibrant downtown, including a Castro pedestrian mall, and Project 35, beginning implementation of the economic vitality strategic plan, which is a total of seven. Um, you did mention that if you had an extra, you would move it to implementing an online permitting system, which currently has three, if you wanted to move one of your other recommendations. I wonder if I could propose uh, that Ms. James also read out the items that have three mm -hmm. to see if there could be some that discussion be around moving votes around to, to bring it over the, over the finish line. Happily. Project eight, facilitating affordable housing development at the VTA Evelyn site. Project 22, expanding safe routes to school. And Project 39, implementing an online permitting system, which if those three were agreed upon the, by the commission would bring the total to 10. Oh, go ahead. Um, Commissioner Clark, I believe, did you want to add? 
I was going to suggest combining forces on Vision Zero safe routes because I, I think same here. So I, I think there's broad support for the concepts within both of those. So I, I just don't know which is which is more encompassing, or or if they if as um, Matt mentioned earlier, if this is a Venn diagram and and we really need both. While I'm not a transportation planner or expert, I believe that it would be correct to characterize it as a Venn diagram, uh, while the Vision Zero plan would really be primarily focused on infrastructure. The Safe Routes to School program does include infrastructure pro progr projects, rather, but the program does focus on education, um, both of the community and of students and families, as well as um, providing other supports for making it to school safely and bike and pet routes. So I'm, I originally went with safe routes, but if, if we decide Vision Zero is the best route, you know, I, I just think it makes sense for us to, those of us who voted for one of the, both of those things to combine forces and figure out which one's the one we're most um, excited about. Is that the one we want to discuss most? Uh, uh, did we want to discuss the others as well? Um, number eight and 39. So these are the three we can discuss, I think, um, which would bring us to a total of 10. I'm gonna ask a question. Would someone have to change their, their votes, right, in order to move things around and add? We don't have to, right? We're, we're just looking at getting a majority to get to 10. Okay. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Gutierrez, uh, sorry, yes, Gutierrez, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Add nine and then the hypothetical, right, which isn't on the list. So technically I can add on another one. <laughs> That's how I look at it, right. In terms of 2022, I think it's, and I, I know there's people out there who go, oh, there he goes again, school district stuff. But when I was on the school board, <laughs> We knew that Safe Routes was specifically dedicated to the communities that you just explained, right? Which were families, outreach into the neighborhoods, uh, the schools, police officers would show up, our chiefs always show up, they give those lesson plans to the kids, these are the ways that you should go, what questions do you have, here's bicycle safety. The other program I'm not sure deals with that at that specific level, with that particular targeted community, and that's my concern, that's why I didn't up to vote for that one, but rather 22. The ideal would be to have them both be combined, but I think the issue here then lies in terms of funding, right? I don't know if because they're broken up into two, the funding that's received by the city or what have you to make 22 happen has to be dedicated just for educational purposes, as opposed to the larger community as a whole. And I think that's why they might have separated both of them out like that, but I'm not sure. I would have appreciated more of a clear distinction on that front, but. You know, I'm not council, right? I'm, I'm EPC, so I, I don't know. And, and that's why I, my friendly opinion is shared with you all in terms of how I looked at 22 because of that and because of recent events in general where I can tell you every year there's always accidents with our middle schoolers going to Graham or Crittenden. And for the most part, um, you know, we've had at least three of our friends be part of an accident where they're fine and, and they're okay, but man, that was scary. Right, so, so that's my two cents worth in terms of how I looked at 22 and the other option, right? So I, I, any support for 22 would be greatly appreciated knowing that we, from a common sense perspective, that we would think that both could be combined, but they're not, right? Um, so having said that, I would, I would be in agreement to also chime in for um, the online permitting option, right? Which in this case is number 39. Thank you. Commissioner Haymeyer. Um, I would just, looking at our list, I don't think we have a sustainability one that has made it to our top 10. Um, the one that I saw, at least some overlap, was 26, the decarbonization one. So um, if we already have the 10 with the, the the priorities that are on the cusp, I would just encourage us to look at this list thematically, um, like Vice Chair Dempsey had originally in his allocation, because I think the decarbonization one would be 
broad and um, obviously intersects with EPC's priorities. And happy Commissioner Gutierrez, I, whatever the majority decides if it makes more sense to go with 20 or 22, um, either is fine with me. Vice Chair Dempsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my instinct here is to be Monty Hall and let's make a deal for anybody who used to watch that show. Um, I, I'm happy to flip my 25 to a 26 if that gets us over the line. Um, I did want to say uh, on the, the question of the, of the bikes, um, I would love it if we could do Vision Zero and have that include the schools. But I will tell you, when I talk to folks, I don't hear people raise a general question of infrastructure. They raise, I want, I, like, I'm worried about the kids. And, and we did lose a kid um, not too terribly long ago. So I, I would actually encourage folks to come on and join us on the safe routes to school because that, that for me, has a sense of urgency to it. Um, and if I, is there, are we at 10 yet? No. Because I'm willing to, like, pull one of the ones I had that has it's just one vote and I'll give it to VTA if that gets us over the line. Uh, that will not bring to a total of 10, but that would add one project. It sounds like the current discussion is generally focused with some mention also of the decarbonization plan on the three items, again, that did have three votes, which are VTA Evelyn, as you mentioned, safe routes to school, and online permitting, which I believe also Commissioner Gutierrez gave his last vote to that one, so potentially of eight. Um, and then also the Vision Zero Action Plan. So that leaves two projects to add to the list um, with, it sounds like, three under major discussion and potentially the decarbonization plan. So just uh, for, for clarification, we have seven already going through. We're discussing three to take it to 10, um, but there's also we have eight. I think online permitting made it to the list. Oh, it made it. Okay. So officially made it. All right. Okay. All right. Well, uh, if no, now knowing that there are, there's a Venn diagram, I, I'm okay to, to push 22. Yeah, I can do that. There was one that was not going to go forward, and I can move it over. Just take one of those off. That is not going to move forward and move it over there to 22. Are we good? Everyone's happy? Nope. Would you oh, there's more. Uh, Commissioner Nunez, you were up next, or? Oh, Commissioner Cranston, I thought that was your leftover one. Sorry. I was uh, willing to. Your microphone, please. Uh, turn it off. Okay. I'm willing to take, since I put two votes in sustainability, I'm willing to take one of my votes on the, from the other two and move it on to the decarbonization plan. So we'll take off the dark skies for now and uh, add it to the decarbonization plan. Um, and I guess that gives it four, right? Yeah. Okay. Any other? Oh, yes, we do. Commissioner Nunes. Thanks. So uh, just to uh, double check, the uh, Safe Routes School um, has now officially passed. Yes. Okay. And then um, the the decarbonization has that also yes. passed. Okay. Um, what are the remaining three? That's a total of ten projects, um, and I'd be happy to read off the the list. Please, absolutely. Project one: homelessness response strategy. Project seven: R three zoning standards. Project 9, a Moffitt Boulevard precise plan. Project 10, the displacement response strategy. 
Project 5, the Downtown Precise Plan, Project 14, Gatekeeper Process, Project 22, Safe Routes to School, Project 26, Decarbonization Plan, Project 34, Implement Strategies for a Vibrant Downtown, Project 35, Economic Vitality Strategic Plan, and Project 39, Online Permitting. Is that 11? I didn't have 34. I had 35, which would be 10. Okay. I have 34 as well. Yeah, so um, what, is it possible to just stretch it out and just deliver 11? I know, I hope you don't get in trouble. I, I believe I can find a way to combine. Thank you, we appreciate that. <laughs> okay, um, and so did you have any other Questions or comments, Commissioner Nunes? Um, I guess given that the uh, safe routes to school item has passed, um, I will just let it be. Um, so I've been run over before when I was in middle school. It's the only time I ever saw my dad cry, and it freaked me out. Um, so I'm one, I'm just trying to, am I that beholden to the office? Um, how many, how many votes does the TDM have? Number 16. It has one, but I do believe we're at the, the total, um, okay. or one past the total that we're, we're trying to cap the okay. advisory body's recommendation to council. Yeah, I Great. understand. There Thank are so you. many that you want to put in. I, I agree. I have another 20 <laughs> I'd like to see rise. But um, OK, if there aren't any other questions or comments, I think we have to make a formal motion. Um, if someone wants to go ahead. Yes, Sandy. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I know we discussed that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the, the way that the discussion has go gone and um, Ms. James has tracked what uh, achieved the majority vote. I think to be consistent with what the other boards and commissions have done, I think okay. we could proceed without a formal motion. Sure, just like a study session. That sounds good to me. As long as you've got it, we're, we're okay. Okay, so let me now, oh, sorry. Commissioner Cranston? Yeah. I, don't know I which would one. take off. I mean, if you want to stick with 10. I, oh, I, oh, no, you're, in the beginning you said other ones that we could deep prioritize. Oh, I, was, I, 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 I didn't know which one, but I'm I could not, do I'm that. I'm not after. going down Because I have one as well. That's so. a political <laughs> rabbit hole. I don't want to go down. Um, <laughs> but um, I guess if you did want, I, one question I was going to ask and I removed myself was, um, is I, my understanding was that the, the VTA Evelyn housing site was pretty much happening. Like we would, we had yeah, signed documents with them to make that happen. And so, I mean, if that's pretty much moving forward and it would take a majority of council to basically stop it from happening, then maybe that's one that could drop off. That was one of our 10, I think. Or no, it wasn't. Okay, never mind. I, I counted, I miscounted them. Never mind. Okay, then we'll close that portion and move on to commission staff announcements, updates, requests, and committee reports. No action will be taken on any questions raised by the commission at this time. Does anybody have anything to report or announce? Uh, I'll just do some of the same olds that I always do. Um, so we usually have EPC meetings the first and third Wednesday, but the, the uh, First Wednesday of April uh, is, uh, I believe, Passover, and so we are not holding a meeting on that date. Um, however, on April 19th, you should expect some minor code amendments related to the Castro Street Ped Mall project. Um, last week, of course, the council approved the Terrabella and public storage project, affordable housing public storage project. 
Uh, so that, that came through the EPC. Um, and of course, coming up, we have uh, on April 11th, we're planning to bring the housing element to council, so stay tuned for that. Uh, in addition, also on April 11th, um, uh, we are applying for a PDA uh, priority development area planning grant. Um, and so we are bringing forward a resolution to council to um, authorize that application. Uh, and so that grant would be used for the downtown precise plan. Fantastic. Any other announcements? Nope. Okay. Well, then we will adjourn this meeting at, it looks like, oh, what is that? 8.55 p.m. Thank you, everybody. And good night. <laughs>